Hello, thank you for coming to the uh, Anti-Spyware Coalition session. Uh, this may be the only semi-traditional panel at uh, Black Hat this year. Um, and we're going to do two of them. Uh, we, in the, the first half of the day, we are going to, uh, um, the first panel, we're going to focus on uh, kind of where is spyware today, what are people seeing out there, uh, how, how are companies dealing with it, how's the enforcement going. Um, and then in, in the second panel, we're going to focus on the future um, and what, are people, what do people expect to see. Um, and uh, we've uh, got a great set of speakers today. Uh, wish I could say I rounded them all up, but I didn't. Nico Sell did a lot of the work. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce them one by one. I'm not going to read their bios because you have them all in your book from what I could tell. Uh, but they're not in the order that they're going to speak, so I'm going to have to. I'll introduce each one uh, individually uh, before they before they speak to let you know where to look uh, in in their bio. My name is Ari Schwartz. I am deputy director of the Center for Democracy and Technology. We lead the Anti-Spyware Coalition, um, and uh, where let me. Uh, give a quick introduction to, to uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology for those that don't know us. We're a nonprofit advocacy organization based out of Washington, D.C. We focus on civil liberties issues, uh, privacy, free expression, uh, and uh, trying to keep the, op the internet open and uh, decentralized. So the, uh, there's a, actually a, a good 10-year history of our organization on this table for those with, that want to follow up on it, um, and some other a paper from CDT and from ASC that I'll refer to in a little bit. So uh, let me launch in a little bit to the, just give a quick intro into uh, where we stand in today in spyware uh, and what, what my organization is working on and uh, how, we, how, we, how the Anti-Spyware Coalition got here. Um, just quickly, how is uh, spyware affecting people? Uh, what, what does it mean to people? Two thirds of IT administrator, and security administrators say spyware is now the top network security threat. Um, according to WatchGuard. 55% of enterprise computers have instances of spyware, according to uh, Gerhard's company, Webroot. Um, and uh, I think that uh, Gerhard's going to be kind of showing some more statistics along those lines, going into more detail uh, in the same area. And then 61% of consumers now have spyware on their computer. That's down from 80%, um, f according to the National Cybersecurity Alliance in a study that they've been doing with AOL. Um, they found 80% uh, the, the year earlier, the December earlier, and this was the, uh, this past December that they, they came up with the 61%. Uh, we, can, we attribute that drop uh, directly to the increase in anti-spyware software on people's computers um, that uh, the, the numbers have gone down since most, ex most spyware researchers have actually seen the number of threats continue to increase. So uh, why do we care about spyware? Um, just to list a few of the uh, um, of, the, of the issues, identity theft being uh, high on the list for keystroke loggers and uh, other kinds of uh, threats that, uh, that uh, steal information, corporate espionage, corporate espionage along those same lines. Um, we've seen some criminal cases involving domestic violence where, uh, where the batterers have placed keystroke loggers on people's computers, et cetera. Um, extortion cases, similar to the corporate espionage cases. Um, and then uh, general fraud, unfair and deceptive pra trade practices. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about uh, what the FTC see has been seeing in that area. And then general privacy and uh, invasions and harm to users' computers. So we've, we've focused on a few different areas in fighting spyware. Uh, and we're going to try and touch on some of these today. I think throughout the day we'll probably touch on almost all of them. Technology, uh, being the anti-spyware tools. Enforcement and forensics, uh, meaning trying to find the bad guys and, and uh, then enforce the law, the existing law uh, w where it needs to be enforced. Um, advertisers and revenue models, since a lot of it seems to be based on advertising. Legislation, uh, where, where do we need new laws? And polling and education. Uh, to help address some of the issues in the technology area, um, CDT helped to form the Anti-Spyware Coalition. And the Anti-Spyware Coalition uh, came about, a lot of people uh, know the history, but just, just to give people a little bit of a refresher course, a lot of the spyware companies and, and adware companies were threatening um, the anti-spyware companies with lawsuits saying that they're calling for calling them spyware, basically, and removing uh, and, and for tortious interference for interrupting uh, their uh, trade relationship with their customers, uh, with what, what the spyware 
uh, spyware companies were calling their customers, people whose computers that they've, uh, um, they've, they're on at, the, at that point. Compromised is the word we're looking for. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm being a little slightly generous there. Um, and uh, the, the anti-spyware companies um, uh, had a tough time uh, with dealing with a lot of these complaints because a lot of them came out of the antivirus world where um, it, the uh, people that, that write viruses don't usually show up and, and try and defend themselves uh, to say, oh yeah, that, that was my virus that I set out there um, and uh, people, people want it on their computer. So uh, they don't really have the background to, to go about doing that and the, and the standards were built in a different kind of a way, to, to be uh, uh, brief about it. Um, and so they, they wanted to get together to uh, form definitions. An earlier attempt to do exactly that had failed, uh, mostly because the coalition was infiltrated by the same spyware groups that they were trying to uh, combat at the, uh, uh, in certain ways. So the, um, CDT was approached about trying to set up the kind of a coalition to work on that issue, work with the anti-spyware companies. We were interested in doing it if, if we could also work with researchers, academics, and public interest groups to try and really flesh out the issues and get at something that could really be considered uh, uh, a true standard. Um, at first, the focus was on trying to get to a risk model. Oh, shoot. But then uh, um, uh, we decided that we needed more help in, in the definitions area uh, because uh, the, it, it, the, there was agreement on about 90% of the terms, but people were using the terms, it's about 10% of the terms to mean different things. So we felt as though we needed to get the definition out there, solve the definitional problem, and then move on. So, uh, and I have the final version of the definition, final working version of the definition on that table as well uh, that we came up with. Um, we had a public comment process on it that a lot of people and some people in this room uh, participated in. Uh, basically, we have a general definition of spyware. I think most people in this room probably take the, the viewpoint that you know it when you see it. Uh, but uh, in order to, to really build a, a standard out there that we could work from, we felt that we needed to go into more detail. And again, this information is on the table over there, and I want to get to the panelists as quickly as possible. So uh, I'm going to skip through some of the more details, f further details here. But the, um, the, the ASC uh, then went through and uh, also built a vendor dispute process so that there was an industry standard for handling complaints when they got them um, for a risk model document. As I said, that was the main goal to try and set up uh, what behaviors, what, what um, observable behaviors uh, spyware had. And then tips for consumers and enterprises. We have the tips for, con for enterprises on the table as well over there. Uh, we held, we've held two public workshops so far, far one in Washington, D.C. that was very well attended. And uh, the chairman of the FTC spoke, uh, Eileen's boss, main boss, um, spoke. And uh, we've had one in Ottawa as well, and we're planning on having some uh, next year as well. These are the members of the coalition, and if you're interested in getting more information about joining, et cetera, right now memberships are limited to anti-spyware companies, people that distribute anti-spyware, academic institutions, and public interest groups. But if you're, you fall into one of those categories or you just want more general information, uh, please come and see me afterwards. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it on to Gerhard so we have enough time to get into the details and get some questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Ari. Um, wanted to uh, add on a little bit on to what uh, Ari was talking already in terms of numbers. I wanted to put some numbers behind the uh, spyware problem. And, uh, but first, before talking about numbers, um, we need to understand what's out there and how do we know what's out there. I think that's the fundamental question in the spyware space. With uh, viruses, it's pretty easy. You stick out the sensor on the internet and you pretty much know what's going on there. Um, Spyware is pretty hard to track down, um, and that's a pretty big challenge for the research industry, particularly uh, as the research process, or part of the research process, is to actively hunt uh, spyware. Uh, at the same time, spyware is changing its face uh, pretty significantly every day, every hour, uh, sometimes even every time you visit uh, a website there. So trying to do this in a manual fashion, fashion was our initial approach to, to do so, but we quickly realized that doesn't scale. Uh, so we have... Uh, put over the past two years some quite significant infrastructure uh, in an automated facility, in a research facility, um, that allows us to crawl the internet on a daily basis, 24 by 7, specifically targeted for malware. So you can think of it as the Google for uh, spyware. And what it allows us to do is obviously to understand where is the spyware threat, how it's changing in a nearly real-time fashion. And uh, we take this data, we spider the internet, browse the internet, 
and keep this data in a big backend database uh, where we store this information for research, for correlation, and for analysis, and particularly as well uh, to create some of the numbers that I'm going to just uh, walk you through in a minute there. In addition to what we do with this information is we publish our quarterly uh, state of spyware report. That's really much a reflection of what's going on on the internet in terms of spyware. Uh, this report is actually coming out in about two weeks, so the numbers that I'm going to show you today are unpublished numbers, uh, but going to be published in about two weeks as part of the Q2 um, State of Spiral Report update. So let's take a look at the, uh, the bigger picture here. If you think about it, uh, look at this graph here. This is pretty much the development in terms of malware or spyware sites found by our research infrastructure. And when I talk about research infrastructure, I talk about this big data center infrastructure that sits on the internet in different places and emulates users, fundamentally, browsing websites uh, connected to a big backend database. So you see here, uh, we do about roughly 4 million websites a week that we analyze for uh, spyware particularly. And we don't just broadly apply our uh, search engine or our spider, but we keep it very targeted towards areas we know there is spyware going on, spyware activity going on. So that way we can be pretty effective uh, without rebuilding the complete uh, Google data center. Uh, in this past quarter, second quarter, we have identified about 100,000 new sites that are distributing uh, spyware or some kind of a malicious uh, uh, exploit uh, behavior uh, code. That brings up to a little bit over 500,000, half a million sites so far uh, being found. So if you look at those numbers a little bit uh, more detailed, uh, you can then also look at where is the stuff coming from? Where is this uh, pieces of malware, where is the spyware coming from? And it's pretty interesting actually, um, in this quarter, the US was by far the biggest uh, uh, contributor to the distribution, the overall spyware distribution. But let's not keep, uh, let's not think that necessarily that all those sites that are distributing spyware actually know about it. So that's not uh, necessarily reflective of the fact that uh, the US, uh, that the people who are behind those servers are necessarily sitting in the US. The people who are behind those servers could sit literally anywhere on the planet. That's part of the challenge with spyware as well, that you usually have different sites for distribution and the people who are behind it are usually in different places there as well. Just as it happens, uh, probably a big part of the internet is here in North America, and that's probably part of the reason why a lot of the uh, spyware distribution sites also happen here in the US. You also see some sites in Europe, but pretty much uh, the biggest part is clearly in the US here. Now if you look at these numbers in terms of time over time, we also look at the other side of the medal. We not only look at who are the sources, but we'll also look at the targets. This is data from a target perspective and basically is a reflection over uh, the past two and a half years in terms of how many pieces of Trojans or how many computers are infected out in the wild, uh, end users computers as well as enterprise computers in terms of how many computers have Trojans on there. Trojans is by uh, any means the smallest numbers of infections. If you look at the bigger spyware picture, including adware, and if you like to add cookies as well, the numbers are obviously much bigger. But I do believe it's important to keep in mind uh, Trojans as being the most malicious forms of spyware uh, here being on the, on the rising edge there. And those are uh, examples of Trojans that uh, we have published some of them. This is an example we found recently uh, with our research infrastructure through an automated fashion. Very classical scenario, uh, drive-by infection. So you go on a website and your browser is being taken advantage because of a security vulnerability that is not patched in your browser. Classical way of uh, spyware is getting onto computers. Uh, the payload in this particular case uh, was a Trojan that's stealing uh, information from online forms. So if you go to a bank, uh, online bank or e-commerce site, the Trojan becomes active, uh, takes, captures the data from your online forms, login information, username, password, but also is capable of capturing a screenshot and then sending it off to a centralized FTP server, as in this case was the case. Uh, and when we uh, got access to this server, when we found this uh, uh, piece of spyware, when we found the server within the first week, about 10,000 people were compromised already. So this is real stuff. Uh, this is real, and interestingly enough, those servers uh, organized the data incredibly well. So you see what you see there: social security numbers, credit card numbers, everything organized by country. So pretty much ready for sale. Uh, organized by, in this case, it was over over 100 countries. Now looking at the amount of instances of uh, spyware on a particular 
machine. If you look, typically what happens is a machine is not typically infected just with one piece of spyware. Usually you have multi-infections uh, because that's how spyware writers are working. They're trying to get as much as possible infections because maybe if this one doesn't stick, maybe another one sticks, for example. And so you see that the, in the amount, the instances of Trojans is always in the range between 1.2, 1.6 instances per infected machine. So that's pretty static actually. But if you look on the other side, on the adware side, Edware is clearly on the decline. While we saw the increase on the, sp on the malicious part on the Trojan side, we clearly see a decrease on the Edware side. And it's probably part of it is some of those businesses are going out of businesses um, and some of those people are refocusing the business. So I think there's probably good reasons why some of the Edware uh, is actually getting smaller. At the same time, the amount of malicious pieces are increasing. Uh, last slide, uh, talking about what is the state of spyware today, if you think about it, it's all about improving the distribution and the obfuscation methods. That's really what spyware writers are all about there. Uh, leveraging various vulnerabilities. Uh, this year, the first six months of this year have been particularly fruitful. There were many, many security vulnerabilities that were not patched immediately. There was many time, many time was uh, time without patches available. This is clearly the windows that spyware writers take advantage of. But also at the same time, if you think about spyware, it's, tar it's about targeting the user. It's no longer targeting the machine. In the early days, it was all the worms. When worms were circulating, it was all about targeting the machines. Now it's all about targeting the user through the browser, through the email, and through any other means that are typically client-facing application. Clearly a, a, a huge uh, increase in use of rootkit type technology to stay obfuscated, uh, to stay uh, beneath the operating system. Uh, and there is actually a pretty interesting talk here at the conference tomorrow that I'm personally looking forward as well. Uh, but also looking at some packing uh, encryption technology being used to really take advantage of uh, being stealth, being under the hood, uh, and not being detected. And again, the main reason, the main purpose spyware is on the market, uh, it's always all about the money. Money is clearly feeding the spyware machine, uh, and that's why uh, the spyware issue is actually a, a real issue and not just an academic uh, thought. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. Uh, next on our list is Dan Kaminsky, who many of you know. Uh, he is from the Docs Para Research. Again, the bios are in, in the book, so I'm not going to go read them again. Dan? So I have a friend. Friend's name is Tori. Good girl. I've known her for a couple years. And uh, I'm over her place, and I'm talking with her mom. And her mom says, oh, Dan, can you take a look at my laptop? It's been broken for a little while. And I say, sure, I'd be happy to. And she goes and she takes it out of the closet. And I say, why is it in the closet? And she says, it's been there for the last six months. And I say, why? And she says, well, it doesn't work. And predictably, I find out that you know, this machine had come down with enough spyware and adware that it was effectively useless. And then I thought about it. This was one machine in one closet. There were probably millions of other machines that have been replaced, that have been sent for servicing, Hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of damage have been done. No one went to jail. No one even got sued. If you want to know why spyware happened and why it's continued to be a problem all these years, I have nothing but respect for the level of buy-in that some of the bigger spyware vendors have, uh, have gotten from the FTC. I mean, the, the other way around, more along the lines of the fact that there have been standards that have been applied to. But if you look at it, you can kind of say it as, you've taken a lot of money, and you've caused a lot of damage. How about we j you change your ways, and then you don't have to give that money back, and you don't have to go to jail? That's kind of what these guys were told, and that's why this is a continuing problem. Um, it is not actually technically feasible to stop spyware. We can't even stop execution of arbitrary code on game consoles. Game consoles with arbitrary, you know, completely fixed hardware, the most investment in cryptography you can get, and completely fixed software, and these boxes still get arbitrary execution of code. You will not be able to solve this problem technically. We can react for a little while until the rootkits get better. But at the end of the day, the virus authors never came forward and sued, because the virus authors assumed if they ever came forward, they'd go to jail, because that's what you do to criminals. I think there's been far too little willingness to admit that what we are dealing with is a large-scale organized crime problem. We've, whatever we've been treating it as, it hasn't been that. Um, now, in terms of technical terms, there is the issue of back channels. 
If you think you will be able to stop spyware from communicating back to its sources, there are, we live in a network society and your devices have so many ways of going back home. One way that is actually useful to track down spyware on your network, and I'm, we have to admit we are all living under limited resources, monitor your DNS logs. I'm serious. If you have a couple boxes that everything in your organization goes to. Watch for lookups and watch for lookups to hosts that seem suspicious and then there's no actual communication there. Because you can, as I've shown, you can move all your communications over DNS. Um, if you th are just sort of accepting the existence of spyware on your network by saying, well, you know, it's not really causing a problem, users still being able to get their job done, spyware actively modifies the way that desktops are functioning. Among other things, several pieces of spyware actually full on add functions to Internet Explorer that are effectively download and install code from URL. Like, that's not a joke. I've pretty much seen that exact ActiveX function marked as safe for scripting from one piece of spyware. So it happens. So if you look at the penetration rates, you actually can foresee with the rest of the ecosystem, you know, with, with the base operating systems getting more secure, you start seeing what's your best route as an attacker to attack a particular machine. Well, look for how spyware has modified that machine. And uh, I wasn't going to mention this, but it's worth, I, I unfortunately have to. Um, who's, who configures that machine? Well, you've got obviously the operating system vendor, but you also have the person who sold you the laptop. People pay for stuff to go on laptops. And it's worth investigating, worth being aware of, you know, can a spyware vendor, because they make a lot of money, can they walk over to Dell and say, please put our spyware on this machine? Have they already? I specifically haven't, you know, after the whole Sony thing went down, I pretty much avoided Sony laptops. Not because I knew, because there were certain fights I didn't feel like getting into. Um, in terms of other stuff, it would be, useful. You can't stop the matter technically. You can create standards that delineate the field very strongly between this is legitimate code that the user has agreed to run and this is illegitimate code where we throw people in prison. This is the goal of any kind of rulemaking, to make a very strong distinction. Because right now, as long as everything's gray, no one goes to jail. One thing that would be a very clear and helpful addition would be if you have code that claims to be legitimate, it must have some visible effect. And you must be able to right click on the visible effect and in under 10 seconds, the thing has to die and never come back. You see an ad you don't like, you right click it, it goes away. You see a pop up that appears to be part of something else. You have to know where it came from. We do this for political ads. I approve this message. You need to know who approves messages and you need to have a way to get rid of it. And if that causes side effects in terms of shareware or freeware on your system that doesn't work anymore, you get an opportunity to tell people that, but you have to make it so it is very clear and quick. The fact that we need to have third-party software to remove spyware from machines is a failure, unfortunately. Um, that's pretty much what I got. Thanks, Dan. Uh, that should make things interesting further down the road. Um, next on the panel is uh, Andre Gold, CISO from Continental. So it definitely does absolutely make things interesting. I think uh, with most organizations, I mean, Continental's no different. We have a, a lot of Tories, you know, within our environment as well. We have Tories out at the ramp uh, within reservation centers that utilize their you know, laptops, their respective desktops for work-related activities, but also find uh, opportunities to do other things, such as find sites and things like that on the internet by which uh, then represent an attack vector within the, uh, within the environment with the, uh, the induction of spyware. I think what we've seen over the last three years, especially uh, over at Continental, is that we no longer face the traditional malware type of demon, i.e. The, the virus and, and the worm out of on the desktop, what we face now is that, that proliferation of the spyware the, in the, the respective adware. Um, in, our, in our respective environment, it's caused a lot of lost productivity in the sense that when we're going out there and we're trying to upgrade operating systems, roll out new machines and everything else, what we're seeing is that it's no longer very easy to just upgrade the environment. What we see is that you know, we're trying to figure out ways in which we can combat and then remove the, uh, the 
the large amounts of spyware that are resident on the machines. Um, at times, we're able to circumvent that and get into process earlier. A lot of times, we're not. And the reason why is because, you know, if a user can still do their job, if they can still be productive to the environment, then a slow machine is okay, especially if they've caused the machine to be slow in and of itself. Uh, and so it is unfortunate that, that we have to use third-party software, but, you know, from my perspective, we have, to, we have to do what we have to do to combat the threat. Right, it's not a technology issue. It's, it's, it'd be a lot e uh, easier to elevate what I call the security IQ of our employees and everything else. I mean, you get emails, excuse me, you get flyers in the mail each day that say, hey, you know, you've won a cruise to such and such, and you've, you've got all these other things, but a lot of people don't call the respective people now and say, hey, where's my free cruise and everything else. But yet, and still, they go to bad sites and say, okay, I'll click on this because it looks interesting and I've won an ad, and oh, by the way, now I've installed Spyware, but hey, I don't want to tell anybody, and you know, I can continue to work. So with that being said and everything else, we, we are looking at to try to take advantage of technology, third-party technology, as best we can. Uh, and part of that process looks at maximizing the footprint that we have on an existing machine out there. I think over time what's happened, especially from an operational perspective, is that desktops and laptops are no longer you know, just simply productivity tools, but there's a huge amount of uh, management overhead that you have to deploy on that respective asset to combat you know, these new and evolving threats. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is looking at how we can maximize the investment that resides on that asset to begin with to combat some of the spyware, adware, you know, type of things that are out there. Thanks, Andre. Uh, last, we have Eileen Harrington from the Federal Trade Commission. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, let me tell you quickly uh, what we're doing at the Federal Trade Commission in the spyware area and what we're not doing and what we can do and what we can't do. Um, the, the FTC's uh, job is not to be um, a cutting-edge research organization um, that uh, is able to uh, recite on any given day um, exactly what the latest uh, developments in the spyware world are. Uh, that's not our function. We don't have those resources. That's what Gerhard and others uh, do. Um, and very generously uh, share their training and expertise with us. Our job is to develop policy and draw lines and get it right, not get it wrong, in terms of trying to set some policy um, in this area. Um, in the policy development area, our first challenge is to develop uh, the intellectual capital that's necessary to understand what, uh, what is happening in the marketplace um, so that as we work at developing policy, we do it from an informed perspective. Um, in 2004, we did a public workshop on spyware. In 2005, we issued a report. In 2006, in the fall, we'll be holding four days of public hearings in Washington on a host of issues relating to protecting consumers in the next decade, and spyware will certainly be chief among those issues. We think it's especially important for us, in terms of the FTC's mission, to be watching the adware space. A lot of the practices that we're hearing about here are criminal. Um, you're right, Dan. And the, the Federal Trade Commission is not a criminal enforcement agency. We don't have that authority. The Department of Justice is the other key part of the enforcement uh, regime here, keystroke loggers, ID theft, all of the stuff, or most of the stuff that Ari displayed on his slide um, at the outset, uh, those practices are covered by criminal statutes and those are enforced by the Department of Justice. The FTC's main law enforcement focus is on unfair and deceptive trade practices. That's what the law that set us up tells us to focus on and gives us the authority to go after. In that, uh, using that authority, we've brought six cases to date against uh, spyware purveyors. Those cases have charged those purveyors with deceptive practices for product claims that they've made, for example, about the existence of spyware on your computer, or about the ability of a product that's being sold to remove, detect spyware. Um, deceptive practices for offering free ad, free, uh, uh, free shareware or freeware without disclosing that it comes bundled with spyware. Um, false removal claims, those are the kinds of practices that we've gone after using our authority to challenge de deceptive practices. We've also alleged unfair trade practices 
uh, for drive-by and other kinds of download practices where there is significant harm. That's what the law requires that we uh, be able to prove. We have to prove uh, harm uh, or the risk of harm that's unavoidable and that isn't outweighed by countervailing uh, economic benefits. That's the legal standard. So we've gone after um, uh, downloads that hijack browsers, that materially alter the operation of uh, the computer, where the software can't readily be uninstalled, where pop-ups are so severe and constant that they really cripple the use um, of the computer. Those are the six public cases. We have other cases in the pipeline, some that are about to be introduced or, or announced very shortly. Um, we also have a settlement coming um, that will be made public when the commission is finished reviewing it. But uh, for example, in that case, uh, the defendants uh, will um, have to pay back uh, all of the money that they made um, off of their activities uh, and will also be operating with a very large suspended judgment over their heads if they've lied about anything or violate the order in the future. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a significant uh, remedy in terms of the remedies that are available to us under the law. Now, technological solutions. Um, I think what, what we're hearing from this panel and what I have always heard is that there is no one solution. Technology alone is not going to fix this problem. The law alone is not going to fix the problem. Um, you know, vigilance alone may not fix the problem because the moment that we hit the right degree of vigilance, there's some new scheme. Uh, it's all of it together uh, that's needed. Um, Self-regulation is a, is a big part of it. The work that the anti-spyware coalition is doing is very significant. Um, notice and consent are key in any self-regulatory scheme. Um, we're also encouraged um, by the trustee trusted download effort. Uh, the Direct Marketing Association has issued guidelines which if actually complied with by their members would make a big difference in the adware space. And we think at the FTC that a key place for us to keep our eye on is the adware space. Because a lot of what's driving um, practices that affect either, you know, enterprise networks or individual consumers' computers comes up in the adware space. The keystroke logging, you know, identity theft, all that really, really bad stuff um, we care about. The FTC is also very involved in, in ID theft issues and privacy. But in terms of our mandate and our statutory authority, uh, we're paying a lot of attention to the development of advertising on, in the online environment. It's a very fluid situation. There are models that have been tried and that have failed. And it's important that we get it right and not either kill legitimate advertising or allow in the name of legitimate advertising practices that are causing enormous harm. And that's a very tough line to draw and a tough balance to get right. Consumer education is another area uh, of activity for us here. Um, we launched this year the On Guard Online campaign. Um, it is not branded to the FTC. It's a comprehensive campaign to educate computer users about a host of threats uh, that they need to take action to guard against. And uh, I can tell you more about it later if any of you are interested, but we have many um, nonprofit groups that have partnered with us to run this campaign, as well as industry groups. Anybody who has an audience uh, can participate in deploying the materials for this campaign. It's an excellent campaign to um, help people know what they can do to protect their computers and their personally identifiable information. And finally, we're active on the international scene um, and are pushing particularly hard for some new statutory authority for the FTC to enable us to do our job better on the international scene um, uh, because we're somewhat limited. Um, you know, it sounds a little lame to sit up and say, well, there's only so much we can do, except it's the truth. We have to operate within the law and we have to operate using the authority that the Congress has given us. And there are some key areas where we simply don't have authority. Uh, but in a nutshell, I've run through what it is that we are doing with the authority that we have and happy to answer your questions. 
Thanks. So uh, uh, we finished right at the time we were planned, which is unheard of for a panel that I've moderated in the past. Usually everyone goes over. But that's great because then it leads more time for uh, discussion, for real discussion. I hope that you'll join us if you have questions. Um, I'm going to start by asking a few of them. I'm going to take a little bit of a moder moderator's prerogative to respond to some of the things that were said here. The, the, this uh, one thing Dan said was no one's gone to jail. Um, I don't, it, it's not 100% true that no one has gone to jail, in fact. Okay, yeah, some 21-year-old kid who doesn't have lawyers behind him and who clearly takes out a health care facility goes to jail. Uh, what is it, direct revenue makes $100 million a year? Well, di direct revenue is being sued by, by the Attorney General of, of New York right now. So, uh, and in fact, on the table, we also have a, a, a report that CDT has done on current enforcement actions, some of them that are in progress, like the uh, Attorney General Spitzer's case, and some of them that have been settled, like this uh, Jameson James Ach and Chetta's case. Um, and it, he was actually installing, he, what, he, what, what he, he was doing was uh, he was running a botnet, and he was just installing, uh, from what I could tell, and just installing Zango uh, and 180 solution software over and over again, making money. Uh, every time it was installed, and uh, it, it, this the quote here, which is one of my favorite all-time quotes. You, you got to read the discovery documents from these cases because the, just all throughout these discover. I mean, there's smoking guns like all throughout these. The, the, people have still not seemed to learn that email is uh, is discoverable in these cases. And he, you know, he set himself up here with it's immoral, but the money makes it right. Uh, another case, one that uh, Eileen Eileen's group brought. Uh, was, you have another case like that with Sanford Wallace, um, who uh, said, you know, I found out a way to install uh, an EXE without any user, any action. There's a time to make money while we can. Obviously not extremely technically sophisticated, but significant enough to make over $4 million, according to the FTC, uh, to do that. Uh, and again, in the discovery documents in that case, too, um, I have one up here that I just pulled up while uh, they were speaking. Let me see if I can zoom in here a little bit. Um, so you can see he basically says, um, uh, you know, he's talking about how, uh, uh, and again, uh, he, he has guys that are working for him. Uh, this is his, the, his partner, Walt Rines, who says, uh, um, the homepage thingy, uh, he, he, including the homepage thingy as a DLL, so you will never lose them once you get them. Uh, I will pay for the banners because earlier he says I'm paying 80, 80 cents per thousand banners for, per thousand impression that I assume that means. Um, and then he says, uh, you know, um, he, he glues to the uh, SSH so that he makes sure that he doesn't crash. And then he's going to put all of his exploit stories at this website eventually called royalpainintheass.com. <laughs> so I actually went to royalpainintheass.com. Not to take us too far off on a tangent here, but definitely relevant. Have you tried this, Eileen? Yes. Do you know where it takes you? Let's see if it comes up. So I should also note while this while this is loading, it seems to be taking a little while. Um, wait, wait, wait! Broken networking at a hacker con. <laughs> Oh, whatever. Well, let's see what happens here. Oh, I shut down the other one, the other page. But uh, um, his uh, his email address throughout this this thing, and it's still his email address, from what I understand, is uh, DJ Master Web, um, and uh, the Royal Pain in the Ass eventually will resolve to uh, OPM Nightclub in Caesar's Palace. So he happens to be working here right now. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking um, around the room. That's a Aren't you? So. Yeah. So um, and 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 so that leads. I mean, that sort of leads to the question about. Um, uh, I guess uh, there's. A, I don't know, Eileen, if you can talk about working with. I mean, the, the, here he's basically saying that he's that he was holding users' computers hostage uh, in the emails, et cetera. Working with the Department of Justice uh, in these kind of cases, how that works. If you go in a little bit of detail about that, and also about finding, you know, finding these guys and. Um, and getting money. Oh, here it comes getting money from them uh, um, when when you do do get a, a, a case like this. Well, we work closely with the Department of Justice and with the com computer crimes group, particularly. And there's not a lot more that I can really say publicly about that. Um, but we we do work closely. We're, we these are our colleagues. We all know each other well, and our offices are two blocks away from each other. So 
um, and, and in fact, some of the people who work at computer crimes used to work at the yeah. FTC. So it's a very close working relationship. Um, you know, finding uh, uh, you know, Gerhard, I was, in, I was interested in Gerhard, interested in all of us, a little disheartened to hear people like Gerhard say that, um, that finding uh, the people who are uh, behind some of the spyware activities is challenging and sometimes impossible. Um, you know, I would agree with that. Um, at the same time, um, we've certainly found all of the defendants in the cases that we have brought. We have done uh, the most thorough um, financial discovery and tracing that we can uh, and have gotten as much money as we have been able to locate back uh, where the legal theory uh, is there to get the money back in the first place. Um, there's some challenges with spyware in terms of what the law um, provides for in the way of financial remedies. Um, the Federal Trade Commission Act gives the Federal Trade Commission the authority to go into court and the court to order redress to consumers. There you have to show that there is some um, claim or practice that the consumer relies on to their detriment um, that entitles the consumer ultimately to get their money back. That's sort of like fraud. So okay. when, when my friend's mother had to put her laptop yeah. in the closet for six months. Right. Let me tell you, we have a lot of people who work at the FTC who've had to put their computers <laughs> in the closet too. And we've had FTC computers that we've had to put in the closet. <laughs> so this is, this is, you're right. I mean, there are computers everywhere. I'm, what I'm talking about here is what the law says and the remedies that are available under the law. One remedy is basically redress or restitution where there's reliance uh, as is the case where there's fraud. Um, that's hardly ever what happens in a spyware case. Uh, so what we have to look at instead is the remedy of disgorgement of ill-gotten gain. That's a, a remedy, an equitable remedy. There have been some interesting um, court decisions recently uh, that, that haven't pleased us too much in cases having nothing to do with spyware, but cases that the FTC brought where um, the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a pretty powerful federal appellate court covering New York State and other areas up that way, said that to get disgorgement, um, we have to prove that the money that we seek to disgorge um, flowed directly from the wrong to the defendant who we are suing. As you know, in a lot of spyware cases, um, there, there's a whole distribution network and the money gets split up among all sorts of different players. And the effect of this decision on disgorgement um, has been uh, quite troublesome to us because if you take the court's decision and apply it to a spyware case where you've got a broad affiliate network, um, what we would have to do is name every single affiliate and trace every dime that uh, is generated to the particular defendant or affiliate from whom we are attempting to obtain disgorgement. Um, so this is a troublesome situation. Uh, we don't necessarily think that the court got it right and that's only in one circuit. But it's very tough to, um, under the law, to get the kind of uh, financial remedies included in the remedy package. The, no trouble getting injunctions, you know, because we can sh show the bad practices that then can provide a basis for the court to say, don't do this anymore. But we all know that saying to people who are doing this kind of stuff, don't do this anymore in a civil action is not necessarily the greatest deterrent What to about action. criminal trespass? What about it? I mean, it's not, in, it's not in the area of, it's, it's not in the FTC's it's jurisdiction. Not that, yeah, it's not, it's not in the FTC's jurisdiction. It's not in um, most most state AG's jurisdictions, it's in the jurisdiction of local prosecutors and the Department of Justice, Cr criminal enforcement authorities. Now, you know, I live, like Ari, um, in Washington, D.C., where there's a local crime emergency that's been declared, but don't believe it, because D.C. is really a nice and safe city. But the police and the prosecutors are all out, you know, rounding up um, folks who are, uh, you know, um, 
robbing folks, you know, pickpocketing and doing that kind of stuff. And every time they're doing that, you know, I can tell you they're not doing the, the, the District of Columbia Police Department, I don't think has a spyware unit. <laughs> um, you know, this is a problem. It, and it, it, it's a problem because you're absolutely right that millions of dollars are being lost um, when machines are rendered inoperable and networks are crippled. And it's one of a host of issues that are facing basically the same organizations. So what are we going to do? You know, how, how do you set the priorities? How do you marshal the resources? I mean, just to, just to follow up on that, I mean, what can uh, the folks in here, the researchers, yeah. researchers and uh, people that work on security, when they come across something, call, what can they do? Call and email. Let us know. You know, we really need you to be the eyes and the ears. Do you want to follow up on that point? I bet there's somebody here from an ISP who'd like to try an answer at that. that. That was also a real big challenge in the Trojan that I was mentioning here in this example. It took us weeks uh, to figure out, first of all, who is responsible for this machine because the ISP was not responsible for it. The end user was running the machine within the ISP's host there. So that was a big part of the challenge there to track that down before we got some action going there. Yes. Does, uh, does someone want to does someone want to take that, Dan? Well, if, if, if you <laughs> asking me about spyware from Sony, awesome. Um, there is no difference. I mean, there is a certain set of behavior. It doesn't matter who's doing it, and that was one of the real problems we had during the uh, during the Sony fiasco. It wasn't just that Sony did what they did; it's that a, a fair number of vendors who can go nameless said, "Oh, this is Sony." Well, Sony can't do anything bad. Um, well, that and they could sue us into a small spot on the ground. So um, there is no difference between it. If you are behaving in a manner that is violating the privacy or violating the um, stability of a user's machine, you're liable for it. Yeah. At least, at least, let me put it this way: at least that is the ad. Says, you know, I'm an engineer. My my goal here is find problems, and if they're illegal, get them forwarded to people for societal enforcement. So it, this problem lives at the legal technical boundary. We can technically find what we're able to. We can technically remediate what we're able to. But eventually, you know, we can't go around arresting people. Although, damn, that'd be fun. <laughs> but, but you know, you are, uh, to say that this problem, in, in its worst iteration, certainly lives at the legal technical uh, boundary is absolutely dead on. It does. It does. And you know, the, the people who do it know that. And um, you know the questions for the Congress are whether they want to change the legal boundary, and the questions for researchers and technologists are how fast can you move the technology boundary. The only thing that appears that it could work is the blacklist approach is as inflexible and unworkable for you know we abandoned blacklists on our firewalls a long while ago. At least most people seem to have. You know, oh, we'll block this, oh, we'll block that, oh, we'll block that. There really needs to be a prescribed whitelist of legal behaviors for what is going on here. And anything that deviates from that list needs to be presumed basically criminal unless proved innocent. I mean, that's a fairly significant change, but that's the market we're looking at right now. We're looking at a market right now that is, you know, granted, it's getting better. And in fact, I've been, you know, reasonably satisfied with the types of efforts I've been seeing, but you're right, it's, it's a jurisdictional issue. You are so constrained in what you can do for well, the problem. Well, and the other concern is that, um, you know, is to pay attention to uh, advertising models as, as they develop um, in, uh, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the adware space. It's, 
uh, it's important to not um, draw a line that chills protected speech, that um, deters what could be very legitimate advertising. And that's, that's really hard. I think in this area, um, we have found, and the FTC has been involved in policing advertising for a long time. And I think that we have found, um, you know, watching the development of internet advertising models, and there really aren't models that have taken firm root yet. You know, every so many months we see a new model developing and it's tried, and there are sometimes problems and sometimes we have to sue, and, you know, other times things just don't take off. But how is, you know, advertising really going to move in this channel? Um, because people really want the content and something has to support it. And so these are big challenges. The, yeah, just to, I wanted to give Gerhard a chance to, um, because I know that uh, you know Weber has to make these decisions about what gets on, what, what you add to your list, and what you don't. I was also wondering if you could talk about behavioral, uh, some of the new behavioral things that people are looking at doing sure. that anti spyware. We are facing this uh, this decision pretty much every day when we get some new piece of, uh, of spyware that we have to make a decision now. Are we going to detect this one? Are we going to block this one? Are we quarantine this one? And we have a pretty well-defined uh, procedure that we have documented that is very transparent, very clear in terms of if it falls in this category, it establishes this behavior, if there is an uninstalled routine, if there is contact uh, uh, points of contact on there, how you can contact the vendor. So it's a pretty methodical way we have developed here uh, because we need to stay clear as well. We need to be uh, fair at the same time to everybody, treat the, uh, treat the good guys and the bad guys pretty much at the same level. So uh, we're pretty much working from a working book here uh, that we have developed that we use as a guideline for our researchers when we make a decision are we going to add detection for this one or quarantining uh, particular uh, pieces of spyware. And, and that's what the, the ASC risk model is supposed to do. We're supposed to help uh, the, the companies in this space help make those decisions about what gets on, on your scorecard or your list that you make, those, you base that on. Um, and, and that's available on that table too for people that want to follow up on that. Yes. I believe it's at the, again, this is a problem at the legal technical boundaries. What I want is, is for when these spyware vendors go to their lawyers, say, is it safe to do this? I don't want them to say, well, there's nothing that specifically bans it. And, you know, and th this is a different model, but it, it needs to be this way. Um, you are banned from putting ads on a user's machine unless you are compliant with X, Y, and Z. So there is a particular whitelist, there's a particular path that you can follow to do things that allow you to put these ads up with constraints. It has to be easy to detect where they came from. It needs to be easy to uninstall the software that's causing it. It needs to happen within a certain amount of time. You change it from, well, you can't do that and you can't do that to, listen, your entire industry has caused hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage. With planes, if planes were falling out of the sky, we'd have pretty good regulation. You know what? Planes could fall out of the sky. We do have pretty good regulation. You don't get to fly unless you pass those rules. What I'm saying is you don't get to put ads on machines unless you pass certain rules because that's the level of damage we're seeing. You know, when it's the number one problem that IT administrators are coming out with, you know, the scale of damage here, this, what was the numbers at one point? 80% of machines had it? Yeah. I mean, we're, we can't mess around with this stuff. We need a new model for dealing with spyware. Can, can, uh, can I also share the notion, I think there is even, even further, if you look purely from a technical perspective, I think that the, the model that we are subscribing today in the, in the whole malware industry, be it antivirus, be it anti-spyware, be it other industries that are targeted to the malware space, the blacklisting model is not going to scale. We are, re we are clearly reaching the limit of those technologies now, and I think it's the same case here. We need to start rethinking the whitelisting model as well from this perspective. And the whitelisting model is not something radical new. It has been in use for many years, but the challenge is how do you manage your whitelist uh, in, an, in a scalable way in an organization and enterprise there. Uh, but I think um, I subscribe to that uh, thinking pattern as well that we need, towards, uh, need to move towards a model where we think about uh, what is good and what is allowed versus what is, what is the bad stuff that we want to keep off the machines. Yes.
Andre, could you take that one actually? Since uh... <laughs> oh joy, thank you. Um, so I, you know, I I, I saw a friend TSO from uh, Liberty Mutual who uh, started uh, the Razor Group for uh, for for Buying View, and, and one of the, the things that, from my perspective, that you always have to evaluate is uh, evaluate not only the talent but the the, eth uh, the ethical aspects of that as well. I mean, having an entity that potentially can compromise, you know my organization and leak its intellectual capital and, and other things like that um, isn't necessarily a risk that I'm going to take as it relates to hiring an entity just because they have, you know, the skill set there. So I think, you know, there's, although we have, we have seen other organizations, you know, do very, you know, s contrary things, um, but I think, you know, there's, there's a moral question that you have to ask and, you know, and that question is, do you basically employ somebody, employ an entity that is very talented knowing the fact that um, basically you're letting danger into the home and that in doing so that the organization may be compromised. Um, that's just something that, that uh, a risk that we're just not going to take. Because a lot of times, you know, out there in the field, I mean, if you think about from an information security program, right, you have three elements, people, process, and technology. Uh, in a spiral case, we're talking about, you know, having inadequate technology to deal with a threat and everything else. But, you know, if I uh, educate my people and I have maybe defined processes and everything else, I can do a lot, a better job at combating the spyware menace within my environment uh, versus adopting our, you know, installing new technologies. And so that just goes back to the question, I'm not going to hire an entity that compromises that, that people element that I mentioned there. In the back, in green. Yeah. Is, is Jerry Dixon here actually right now or I don't know, you over there you want to do you want to wait to do you want to take this now or do you want to okay he's with the Department of Homeland Security and so they've they've there is there actually has been some legislation that has passed over time to try and help companies share um, information um, but uh, uh, let's take it from the FTC's perspective for now and then we'll let Jerry talk more generally about the government the, the rest of the government well, the, the issue that you really touch on is um, data security more than spyware, although spyware can compromise the security of data and personally identifiable information. Um, and, and where the liability can arise um, on your side or on the part of the private sector is where uh, there is personally identifiable information, sensitive information on the system, and um, the system operator has failed to take reasonable and appropriate steps to safeguard um, that personally identifiable information. What constitutes reasonable and appropriate steps really varies from case to case. It's a flexible standard, but that's the standard that the FTC has adopted under our statutory authority. And when we've sued um, in cases where there have been uh, data breaches, it's been for failure to have in place uh, reasonable and appropriate measures to safeguard data. Um, if you're thinking about getting in touch with us uh, to report a spyware problem uh, or a hacking problem or so, you know something that's happened and you've got reasonable and appropriate measures in place, then you shouldn't have a problem. You shouldn't be afraid to get in touch with us. Um, if you've had a data breach and you uh, didn't have those kinds of procedures in place, 
you know, um, you may wind up uh, on the other end of an enforcement action, um, but it would still be, you know, we're likely to find out about it anyway. Um, so, you know, you might as well let us know. And we'll work <laughs> out the terms of the order, but, you know, we could also, and, and you may mitigate in some way the, the nature of the remedy sought. No promises. Uh, in, uh, uh, there have been, we've had some companies come to us, to, to CDT, and we've kind of been a middle middleman. We've served as a middleman in some cases where we've uh, independently researched the same things that the companies have been finding uh, and um, been able to, uh, and given that information over to the FTC and others uh, as completely independent research that we've done just using the same uh, set of research. So I just, uh, that's another, op another way of going about it. No, I, I enjoy the, the comment and the feedback, though. I mean, it's interesting uh, in the sense that I, as an organization, potentially, you know, go to the FTC, whomever, um, and I want to ensure that my organization's privacy is safeguarding everything, but maybe I'm not as diligent as I should have been, and now so you flip the angle around a little bit instead of helping me solve my, what, my, what my problem is, is now I face prosecution and other things like that. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think that model works well. Well, we are not here to help you solve your problem. We're here to enforce the law, and we're here to understand what's going on in the marketplace that may violate the law. So if you're, I mean, the FTC does not exist to help individual consumers solve their problems or, you know, network operators to solve their problems. We exist to enforce the Federal Trade Commission's prohibition on deceptive and unfair uh, practices. I'll also say I, that I know for a fact, because I've been CC'd on some of these, that the, the FTC gets quite a lot of anonymous tips as well right. uh, for people out yeah. there. Um, you want to follow up on that? Or? I'd like to follow up okay. on that. There does seem to be a fairly inexorable push towards centralized analysis of vulnerability data. Um, from what goes back uh, to Microsoft through their online crash analysis to what goes around just random, like all the antivirus software or much of it is starting to go ahead and put things back. Gerhard, I'm sure your software does reporting back to what it's finding. Um, if you don't have that, you're right. You don't get a global view. I mean, the, the definitive quote is you can't manage what you can't measure. And without global management, measurement, there's no global management. Um, I do agree, though. It does seem to be problematic if by participating in this system that is making the internet more secure, you're opening yourself up to point source risk. That's a problem. I mean, that's something that your lawyers can just be like, you know what, there is a, it, it becomes almost like a uh, tragedy of the commons. You know, this may be a right. good thing for everyone, but if, you know, we can get prosecution over a particular thing that is in this data, we have a, you know, we shouldn't give it out. And we probably have a little bit of an unfair advantage here because in, this is part of our business, finding those pieces of uh, new malware, and we are working with uh, the authorities pretty much on an ongoing basis. If we, if we find something new, no problem from our end to work with them because there's nothing on our end. It's usually something that we get reported from the outside or find through our research system anyway. So we're very open about that and we have a, actually a very good relationship with those folks um, in terms of uh, getting it shut down if needed. You've been in prison in the back there, it's hard to send Yeah, I heard the 80% uh, figure quoted uh, a little while back. Um, when, you, when you go to the, the reputable
I'll start by saying that uh, tracking cookies do show up in the anti-spyware coalition definition of spyware, but uh, um, I'll, I'll just say point people to that definition. Um, but uh, if I, I was wondering if you, I mean, maybe Gary. By design, my slides excluded cookies today. I agree. Cookies are probably the single most overrated security threat that we've seen in you know, the last 10 years. Um, that being said, it is worth recognizing that web applications are a different application sphere than what is on the desktop and that certain uses of cookies, especially if you have an individual site that you go to that gets personally identifiable information and then that personally identifiable information is retransmitted to every other site you go that has a, uh, a tracking cookie. You know what? I, I have a hard time honestly not calling that, and I'm one of the stronger people who hate calling cookies a security threat. Even I got to admit, if I can go to a random site and it can tell me exactly who I am because four months ago I went to some other site and I told it, okay, that's a problem. And, and that's pretty much the definition of tracking cookie in the, in the uh, anti-spyware coalition uh, definitions. Uh, let's see if we can get one more question in. Last question. I'm, I'm probably the best person to answer this on the panel. So um, the uh, national, state by state, we've, we've seen a number of laws pass. Um, in fact, Louisiana just passed another one, and I, so I don't know what the, and I think there are a couple more under consideration, so I don't know what the total current number is at the states. Most of those state laws uh, don't really go beyond what's already illegal in most, uh, under current consumer protection law in the states, but some of them do raise the penalties uh, in the states, um, and so uh, you have seen some cases brought under the anti -spy, under the spyware law. Most notably, uh, and again, this is in the the, uh, the the full enforcement cases there. If you want to look at the state laws, uh, um, Texas's attorney general has brought a case under their spyware law against Sony, um, and it's continuing that lawsuit, although the other ones are settled. So. Uh, that's an interesting one that's out there. On the state, on the, on the federal level, there are a number of bills that are out there that do uh, different things. Uh, the House has passed two bills, actually. Um, one that would require notice um, for ads and the type of ads that you see from software um, and certain types of tracking um, and uh, would raise the penalties and give the FTC civil enforcement penalties which is uh, that they could get more than just the ill-gotten gains. They can give it, get actual amount of uh, the, the amount, the actual amount that uh, the uh, bad guys made off of. Uh, I mean, beyond that, they get an actual number fine, like eleven thousand dollars per incident, kind of thing. Um, and then uh, Senate bill, which is similar to that, um, has passed out of committee, but is probably not going to the floor this year. And since it's going to be the end of the Congress uh, and the it, you're, you're unlikely to see the two come together, although it's still a small possibility, but um, it will probably have to start all over from scratch next year, uh, unless something can be worked out between the House version and the Senate version. And then also the other House bill is a criminal bill that would uh, criminalize. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of this is already criminal under uh, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm blanking here, Elaine, uh, the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, thank you. Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and so this adds on a couple new pieces to the co Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Well, I want to thank the panel. Does anyone have any last comments? Um, I want to thank the panel, and we're going to break, and then we'll come back and talk about the future, where things are going, et cetera. Well, we're going to start up again. Uh, I'm sure that people will be uh, coming in as we go along here, but. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we have, we have a larger panel and make sure that everyone has time uh, to give their points and we can get an active discussion like we did the la in the last session. Um, the, first we're gonna, uh, the, the first speaker that we're going to have is uh, John Heisman, who's a consultant at, uh, the principal security consultant at NGS. John? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, wait, one second. Just as a reminder, I'm not giving everyone's uh, bios out again. Uh, they're they're in, in your books, so I'm just going to announce who the person is and you can look up the bio. So um, the first point on my notes here, um, I was going to talk about um, increasing rootkit-like technology in spyware. But actually, bef before I talk about that, 
I want to go through the um, process um, from um, getting spyware onto a user's machine um, all the way through to how it actually might com communicate that data. Um, so if we think about current delivery mechanisms for spyware onto a user's system, um, typically browser exploits, um, bugs in uh, file format bugs, so like the, the recent spate of um, vulnerabilities in uh, Microsoft Office products, um, they, they're being used to um, deploy spyware. Um, peer to peer uh, software, um, IM networks. So I think all of these um, delivery mechanisms will um, continue in the future. Um, file format vulnerabilities certainly show no signs of abating. So um, maybe browsers will become more locked down, um, but file format vulnerabilities in, in various pieces of software commonly found on user systems, so media players, that type of thing, will continue as a mechanism of delivery. Um, we may actually see some kind of two-stage um, deployment mechanism of Spyro in the future because of technologies like um, least user access, so Lua coming out on Vista, um, and various identity management solutions that try and restrict access to um, personal user data. So um, we may actually see the initial deployment where through a vulnerability in the browser software, uh, the Spyro application starts running it then actually um, invokes um, a second exploit to try and escalate privilege so it's then able to um, access the information it wants. So escalate from a low user privilege to admin. Um, and once it's um, attained admin privileges, it can then um, hook um, system-wide um, and it can install a kernel component, hence the um, rootkit-like technologies. Um, so the, the rootkit-like technologies um, will see um, anything done, done in, currently done in um, user mode. So things like um, layered service providers, Winsock LSPs for um, hooking network traffic. Well, we might start to see that um, rather at a um, kernel level. Um, and this is essentially going to have to raise the bar for spyware detection software. Because if you have, if you have spyware that has kernel components, Essentially, this means you're going to need spyware. You're going to need um, spyware detection software that also has a com kernel component, because you're not going to be able to detect a kernel component from user mode um, with much success. The next point I want to make is um, kind of emphasizing something that Dan made in the um, first session, which was essentially any spyware on your system makes your system um, less secure, and this is for two, re two reasons. Firstly, the spyware might, uh, might install something, a component that is designed to help it update and stay alive on that system. So as Dan suggested, um, an ActiveX control that has a method that will um, allow you to um, remotely run any executable. Um, but also, the quality of spyware itself, spyware is typically poorly written. There are security vulnerabilities in spyware, so buffer overflows, etc. The Sony rootkit is a good example. Um, essentially, they developed a system that enabled them to hide processes and files um, by hooking um, various uh, functions in the kernel. Um, but that could be abused so that by simply renaming an executable, you could take advantage of that, that functionality in the kernel and hide your own processes. So instantly, um, that made the machine um, less secure because malware that was simply running in user mode could make use of that and hide itself by simply calling itself $sysfubar.exe. Um, so it, it's a concern that if spyware <coughs> moves into the kernel, that's going to make your system even um, wider open. Um, I guess in the future, um, Again, in the first session, Dan mentioned um, using DNS to see what your machine is actually, where it's sending information. Um, so in the future, we may expect to see um, better uh, or harder to detect um, channels out of the, the, the spyware software. Um, so better, essentially, covert channels. And the final point I want to make is that um, we may actually see spyware that um, attempts to detect when the user is running um, spyware detection software and attempts to subvert that software. So if it's running in kernel, 
um, hooks a function that um, starts a new process. Um, and then the spyware has a list of um, known detection software that it wants to block running. So um, I guess really, um, to conclude, I would say that um, the more rootkit-like technology we see, the harder it's going to be to remove, the harder it's going to be to detect. And really, this is going to have to um, result in um, manufacturers of spyware detection software really um, raising the bar in the, in the way they detect. Um, so that's it. Thanks, John. A lot to think about there. Um, Ron Davidson is next. He's the CTO of MI5 Networks. So I will say a sentence or two about my background because I think it's a little different and that's my perspective on some of these issues. Uh, I did spend most of my previous career over 25 years with a, an intelligence community, a foreign intelligence community, uh, the Israeli one, uh, doing uh, all sorts of high-tech uh, spy wars. On my, some people would call these spy wars, but on both sides of the uh, of this front. So uh, most of my experience come from a, a say national security uh, point of view, but uh, I think it things uh, I see how things directly relate to uh, uh, to corporate spyware, which is where we started this uh, panel, uh, and and the future of of spyware. Uh, first, just regarding the uh, numbers that we, we saw in the previous uh, session, uh, we also we do not see 80% of the uh, end, end users infected. Uh, I don't see how, uh, how uh, people are able to detect so many uh, infected PCs, as we call them, unless they really uh, count every, every uh, third, party, third party cookie or something like that. Uh, we, uh, we do see some uh, decline. I, I think I, I agree with what was uh, presented here in the adware, and I think in general in the future, uh, the place of adware is going to be uh, is going to be shrinking, and the place of the uh, uh, much more severe stuff. In, in that sense, it's going to be more about the quality of uh, of spyware, the, and not just the uh, the quantity, not how many machines. So even if uh, uh, you take the corporate point of view. It's not. It doesn't really matter how many how many machines uh, are infected with a keylogger. If just a couple of machines, but uh, strategically placed keyloggers uh, are there, then the problem is is uh, is uh, much more critical than if uh, 70 or even or 40 or whatever number of uh, machines are infected with uh, with adware. In general, I, I don't see a. Uh, huge developments on the technology side, and personally I'm not very much concerned with uh, yet another generation of uh, rootkit uh, technology. Uh, there will be, uh, there will be uh, additional uh, tools to detect those. There will be uh, virtual machine rootkits, and there will be virtual machines where that users are running to uh, avoid the rootkits and, and so on. So the, this technology uh, war will, will uh, continue. I think that the uh, main uh, complexities of the future are going to be in uh, more maybe on the operational side of things and who is behind spyware and how complex is the spyware operation. Uh, once again, I'm talking mainly about corporate spyware, not just adware. Uh, and, and there will be uh, additional ways to uh, get into the uh, corporate network and additional ways to get out of it and there will be a hybrid of ways we already see some of these things when you go in through the uh, mail chain, you go out through the uh, HTTP, uh, and we will see all, all, all the p possible combinations of getting in through some uh, Wi-Fi or uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, access and getting uh, out through some uh, covert uh, Skype or other VoIP uh, session and so on. So, and, and some of, the issues, of these issues are technology uh, so, so you need to, to excel on that uh, front, but some of these issues are really to, to come up with the uh, infrastructure to uh, support, from the operational point of view, a large-scale uh, large uh, corporate spyware operation. So you need to understand the network that you're attacking. You need to uh, find different ways to go in and out. You need to find ways to expand uh, and uh, your presence inside the corporate network uh, one, once you're there and to find the interesting uh, stuff uh, in there and not just randomly attack one or a machine that is uh, maybe more vulnerable than, uh, than the other. And I think 
with this uh, go on, who, who is behind spyware? So, uh, of course, the previous session was mainly about hardware and hardware companies. It's not that I like hardware, but I think that uh, this, is, uh, this is really the place where maybe the regulators, the prosecutors, and uh, legislation and so on can, can do uh, more of that, but all these are completely irrelevant when we are talking about more critical spyware, the, the, the criminal uh, type of things. And, and we, we, we know when we see that uh, organized crime uh, is already involved in, uh, in spy, especially in spam. There, there were several cases where there were full-blown war between uh, anti-spam and, and the uh, spam mafia uh, uh, out there. And so far, at least in the previous rounds, the uh, spam mafia won and not necessarily the, uh, the good guys. Uh, so. I, I can certainly see how many uh, more uh, uh, organizations and individuals uh, like those are, are coming into the picture, bringing in more resources, more operational capabilities. This is becoming a, a global war, not something that is, uh, can be handled uh, locally or within the United States and, and so on. And the global cooperation uh, between the bad guys is uh, at least as good as uh, the global cooperation between the good guys. Uh, so uh, I think in, in particular it means that uh, some of the uh, avenues, some of the uh, ways that we need to, uh, uh, to make it a significant progress in is the cooperation between all the parties involved. I heard the keynote speaker this morning uh, from, the, from the FBI, but I think it's also uh, uh, more cooperation between the uh, industry, within the industry, not necessarily just the industry. Uh, players and the government, more cooperation between ISPs and, uh, and uh, security uh, vendors, between security vendors, more hybrid, say, or, or multi-level defense uh, products or strategies that combine the, uh, the offerings or the, uh, the advantages of uh, different uh, security uh, approaches. Um, I think in I, I could see some similarities in the way uh, the, the uh, crime were or, or the critical spiral is going and, and, uh, and the uh, global crime and even terror. I, I can, uh, I, I can uh, talk a little bit uh, more about this may, maybe later, later, but in, in any case, we are going to the point where the legislation is irrelevant, the regulation is irrelevant, we'll have to, to fight it and, and, and we need uh, uh, through cooperation, uh, through global cooperation, and through better defense, and maybe sometimes uh, even some attack. Thanks. Uh, next on the list is Drew Manis from Walt Disney. Thank you, Ari. Um, from an enterprise standpoint, the threat of spyware, I, you know, I'm, I totally agree that adware is on the going to be on the decline, but there's still work that we need to be needs to be done in that area. Um, policies around making sure you know where your ad dollars are going, um, education of your own users, and also there's the delivery of content to your customers and protecting that. You know, the past 10 years, it's always been about protecting the inbound traffic into your environment. Now we have to start thinking of, well, we're allowing a, a trusted vendor to shovel code to our customers we do have some responsibility there to make sure that that code is clean and not malicious. Then also from the internal side, I think there's going to be more of the need to understand exactly what is going on on the network. Um, when you get into a large global corporate environment, that becomes challenging to know exactly what is being connected and what's not. But I think that the tools will come. Um, but on the other side of it, though, is, is when you look at the desktop and protecting the desktop and the deprimitization of the network, we can't keep putting another client for every threat that comes out. Uh, it's <laughs> sooner or later the CFO is just going to say enough is enough. You can't, you know, you got your antivirus, you have your anti-spy, you have whatever the next threat is, and all of those also introduce vulnerabilities into the environment. Right? I'm well familiar with the witty worm from a couple years back. So, I. I think the, the future is understanding what's going on in the network, developing better tools to determine what is on there, and also 
having a forensic capability that I don't think you necessarily have today. Uh, your help desk is going to have to understand that it is spyware. If it is spyware, now you've got to look at your legal obligations on breach disclosure. You can't just treat it like a normal virus. So I think that uh, in the future we'll be seeing more of that as well. Thanks. We'll get m deeper into those quite yeah. think <laughs> those issues that you raised there. Uh, I'm sure in the in the question and answer session. Uh, unless we have Jerry Dixon from the Department of Homeland Security. Jerry. So back to uh, you know Ari's earlier comment about uh, centralizing the internet and centralized control. I think would go a long ways to solving these problems. Was that is it what I heard earlier? Or? So in, in all seriousness, uh, you, you know I think you know what Drew just touched on. You know one of our concerns is the sheer number of products to combat, you know, a multitude of problems. There is some convergence, you know, with your antivirus and uh, spyware type technologies. And I think Ron highlighted a key point that I wanted to emphasize, and this is something that's been real effective uh, with phishing, is, uh, you know, the sharing of these, uh, the repositories or the, you know, the different uh, samples of spyware, the sharing of the databases across the vendors, you know, not playing the game of, I've got more signatures than your company does, or getting into that kind of aspect. One of the things that we've done, just even in the phishing space, is working with law enforcement and some, you know, the anti-phishing working groups, some other organizations. We receive hundreds of phishing reports daily. Every 24 hours, we actually provide a data feed into some of these organizations that, in turn, push those lists out to all the commercial vendors. You know, from our from our perspective, from a U.S. cert perspective, you know, it's going to get the most widest protection, you know, the most expedient way to get protection out to folks and help mitigate or minimize some of this. Um, you know, back to the issue, uh, you know, I know Dan raised, I don't know if Dan's still in here, but, you know, some of the things that we're seeing, you know, it's nice to look at your DNS logs, but we're also seeing host files being modified. We're seeing the use of dynamic DNS with short time to lives. I mean, it's not just a single, there's not a magic bullet for this problem. So, you know, that's really where you got to, you know, be cooperating with everybody to, at least within the vendor space, to really help combat these issues. Um, how many of you have auto run? set up on your machine now, is it, or ha how many of you disabled it? Nobody? Okay. So, you know, one, one of the things, I saw a study I was reading uh, the other day where, you know, somebody was doing a, uh, a penetration test with a uh, credit union, and basically they just put out USB flash drives all over the place, just left them sitting on desks, no message, no nothing. Most of the machine, you know, pretty much all the machines had auto run enabled, and what it did is half of them out of curiosity, plugged it right in, Boom, loaded up, you know, a key logger, beacon home, you know, in this test case, I mean, it was a controlled environment, uh, and basically, you know, they had a high amount of users. It's always about the users, right? They had a large number of users, you know, just, again, plugging it in. So little things like that. I mean, this is a multifaceted problem that we got to deal with. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing from a trends perspective uh, is the uh, very specific targeting against specific organizations. You know, whether it's uh, looking at proprietary information from, you know, for some of the commercial companies that we worked with. Uh, we're seeing directed, uh, you know, emails with, you know, the, the friendly attachment or, you know, kind of the phishing deal. But again, at a very targeted uh, core group of folks that they're, you know, wishing to gain information from. When, you know, so that's one of the increases of some of the things and activities that we're seeing from, uh, from our uh, perspective. Another issue is uh, a lot of popular websites. Uh, we've worked with a lot of companies where we helped them clean up the spyware, give them the advice, and within minutes of them bringing the server back online, get popped again. User has no user interaction, just by you know browsing to the site, get some goodies installed onto the machine. So you know again, it you know it's a widespread problem. You know I used to you know say you know we can you know security awareness will go a long way, which it still will, but now it's to the point where the user doesn't actually have to take in any specific action. Um, the last piece I want to cover is the whole issue of uh, Sony. Um, I know, at least from a federal government perspective, uh, there's actually five criminal cases opened up really quickly. You know, basically, it was being considered a 1030 violation or an intrusion, you know, unauthorized access into a government computing system. Got a lot of people spun up. Sony got a really rude awakening. I know our folks, Stuart Baker is, uh, and I believe he's working with FTC as well, which is our policy person for uh, Secretary Chertoff. But these are some of the types of issues and things that we're combating. Again, you know, no user consent. And then in some cases, as you all know, you know, a lot of times if there is a user consent, it's buried into that, you know, 20-page, you know, small print, you know, click through. So there's a, there's a lot of challenges from a policy perspective. But, uh, you know, again, 
key trends that we're seeing, uh, being, seeing very targeted type attacks. We're seeing the uh, uh, multiple methods uh, being used to phone home and pull down additional goodies. You know, again, kind of a round, you know, round robin dynamic DNS. You know, one minute it might communicate with a specific address to bring in additional goodies, and within seconds later, or you know, hours later, it'll phone home to a different box. They're they're, they're very creative. So I think we're going to continue to see a lot of challenges in this, this space. I think one of the big solutions or, or things that really needs to be addressed is how do we get the vendors together, at least share you know that common set of information so we can get the uh, information out there. You know, I, I see head shaking, but I know you know at least within the phishing space, it's gone a long ways. Uh, you know, in helping that out, and it also helps prioritize when we talk about prosecution and going after folks. You know, law enforcement has a limited set of resources. What those type of efforts do is, you know, when you look at NCFTA or what was talked about at the keynote today, some of the other efforts, is that they actually help prioritize, you know, what are the big fish? What are the top 10, top 15? You know, we're gonna go, go after those, take care of those. When they're successful with those, they'll go ahead and move to the next top 10 or 15. But as that data comes in, you know, it at least helps prioritize to knock out some of the bigger players and then just keep whittling away at it. Unfortunately, I think it's one of the most effective uh, mechanisms that we have today. Thanks a lot, Jerry. Uh, just to follow up on that, the, the Anti-Spyware Coalition is actually, we've just built a system to share information. We, we haven't, it's being starting to be used right now. So it is kind of, uh, we're, we're testing it out and we're gonna see how it works internally and uh, people that are interested in that piece of it. Uh, and, and we will be talking to, to DHS about it in the future, I know for a fact. So uh, um, just to follow up on that, on that main point that you made. Um, there's a lot of different, different ways to go here. Um, I think one, one question that uh, was not addressed that I'd like to hear each person in turn's answer in it is uh, what, what, what do people think about the, uh, um, the distribution of OneCare and Windows Defender and how that's gonna change the marketplace for spyware and the different issues uh, involved in, in, uh, um, in security as it relates to spyware in particular. Um, we, don't, we can go in a, a reverse order if you want to go last this time. Since sure. You, why, don't, why don't we start with you, Jerry? <laughs> sure, put me on the spot. Uh, actually, I should put uh, Jerry Cochran on the spot since he's here from Microsoft. But uh, basically, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's making progress. Um, you know, I think, again, you know, working with, and it, again, it goes back to the way some of these are doing. I know at least with the, the Microsoft solution, there's uh, some more registry real-time monitoring, some capabilities there that are interesting. Um, you know, I haven't actually done a product comparison, but I think anything that helps tackle this issue and tackles this problem is going to help, you know, protect the consumer. So, you know, I don't know what the, uh, haven't looked at any, you know, recent studies on uh, rollout of uh, Windows, uh, you know, one care and, and seeing what the uh, density of folks that have jumped onto that bandwagon, but I think it's, you know, anything out there to combat the problems is positive. But again, it goes back to my earlier comment. Um, you really do have to have some level of cooperation across those products. So they can still tackle the problem from a different perspective, but I think based on the identified spyware artifacts, uh, you know, you, you kind of need to share that information to make sure everybody's pretty well covered. Yeah, I mean, it when we start building it into the operating system or adding it to the operating system, I think that goes a long way towards uh, protection. Um, yeah, I too have not really looked at one care, so I'm not going to go too far, but I, I, I think that's a, a, a welcomed uh, solution. So. And also, with, also without looking too deeply into it, I'm a little skeptic. I think the good guys, <laughs> the good guys are getting The good guys are getting smarter, the bad guys are getting smarter, at least as fast as the good guys, and it's gonna get worse before it gets uh, much better, if it gets much better anytime. So, so I, I think that uh, anybody who can add a layer, I think in general a multi-layer defense is, is the strategy to go for, for the corporate. So uh, if one part on the desktop is improved and some other parts on the desktop are improved and the gateway parts are improved and hopefully the ISP and the overall national infrastructure is better then, and we all cooperate and we'll provide some better service to our customers. But uh, the problem is not gonna get away, especially not just by Microsoft. 
Yeah, I, I basically agree with the uh, points um, just made. Um, essentially, anything that keeps a machine um, more fully patched is obviously a good thing. Um, but I, th I think this will mean um, that we may see um, deployment via um, other common um, non-Microsoft applications. So, for example, if you have um, your system being um, patched um, as soon as a, a Windows patch comes out, um, then um, exploitation of browser, um, i.e. Uh, flaws in IE, may go down, but then you may see a rise in um, exploitation via other flaws, other means, so um, other um, software that's commonly um, bundled with uh, Windows. Um, and invariably, um, spyware will um, um, evolve to um, attempt to subvert um, the uh, Windows Defender and, and one care. So um, I'm sure there will be some attacks that attempt to, to stop it working, to block it in some way, to um, circumvent it. Anyone else want to cover the, kind of the future of uh, um, distribution methods? I mean, uh, I think, Ron, you raised an, it, the, the point about uh, um, keystroke loggers. How do you see them being uh, distributed? I mean, we've seen some of these scams where, the, you know, the, there was a guy in uh, London who, um, you know, had uh, basically sent fake proposals and the secretaries would click on them and um, get get his home built key logger on their uh, on their machines and uh, use it he would use that to uh, as a launching point um, is there any uh, um, any other uh, kind of ideas about how you we're going to see some of that spread in the future um, I really do think um, file format bugs are, are gonna, going to continue to be the main um, method of um, deployment, but there are um, many means of actually getting those um, particular file formats um, onto the system in question. So for example, um, we've all seen um, attempts to get malware onto a system via email where somebody sends you something saying open this, um, and maybe it's some sort of graphic which contains uh, a bug, for example WMF. Um, but um, as Ron said, there are many, many new ways of um, your machine interacting, Bluetooth, etc. So um, there are many um, potential means for actually getting um, the vulnerable, uh, getting the, the infected file onto the target system. But um, as I see it, um, I, I really do believe that file format bugs will continue um, to be a major problem. Well, I guess the variety of way that any piece of information gets into the desktop, the keyloggers will get there as well. Fine social engineering, not just social engineering, but well tuned into the uh, specific recipients is, is uh, one way. And uh, the, all of the uh, technological uh, uh, ways to get there uh, as well. Well, even this guy and Cheta that we talked about him, uh, if he got paid a little bit more by a keylogger, uh, Publisher, then he would install these instead of uh, instead of AdWords. So it's uh, uh, as long as something is installed, keyloggers and the most malicious stuff is installed, then there will always be a way in. Uh, the fact that the system is getting more complex in, doesn't mean that it's just becoming more uh, robust. It's also uh, becoming more vulnerable in other ways, and this uh, it's just a just a process that. Uh, we fine tune all the time, but we open back those uh, uh, knowingly or unknowingly just as much. Uh, just out of curiosity, I'm going to kind of flip the question around a little bit. How many of you utilize like a Tivoli or an SMS or a desktop management solution to actually, you know, I know previous uh, places where I've worked, we've actually created a list to actually go out scan the drives and actually clean, you know, your desktop PCs across your enterprise. Just curious, you know, how many actually lever debt as a tool kind of to combat this problem? Okay, again, just, you know, kind of a, you know, I know we didn't really go into a lot of, you know, we talked about uh, multi-layer defenses, but there's a lot of tools at our disposal. You know, again, it's just like anything, it's, you know, whack a mold. But at least that seems to be, you know, when you've got a large enterprise of 130,000 plus desktops or more, I mean, those seem to be, you know, some effective tools that folks can leverage to, to help with uh, eradicating uh, the spyware. You know, your content filtering solutions at the gateway. I mean, there are just a lot of options out there. It's just, like anything, you know, it's, it's good to say, you know, yeah, I've got firewalls, I've got security infrastructure, but it's back to, are you really managing it? Are you actually watching it and, and, and doing due diligence there? So just kind of wanted to touch on that. One, I had a, actually a question for Ari that you might have from a legal perspective. You know, what are... 
you know, and I've seen, you know, articles in the past and discussions, uh, you know, things being mislabeled as spyware, you know, so what are some of the ramifications and what are some of the things that, you know, I don't know if y'all keep track of some of those issues, but I do know from a liability perspective, it seems kind of an interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the reason that the, the, uh, that, that the anti-spyware coalition basically formed was to come up with, and, and did the reason that we did our vendor dispute uh, process. Uh, to try and make sure that there was an industry-wide process for when people felt that they were being mislabeled, they could go through a step-by-step -step process and that could be addressed um, uh, directly. Now, um, I think that there have been some clear cases where mistakes have been made, um, but I think if you look at the total number of people that are complaining out there and the people that were, where mistakes are made, uh, the number of false positives has been relatively good um, from what I've seen in the industry. Um, I don't know if, if uh, people in here have other viewpoints on that, but. Uh, um, uh, I think that that, uh, um, that 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 they have gone through and, and done a good job. There is the threat hanging over that if you do a, a bad job, you can be sued for uh, tortious interference, et cetera. There has been a push for um, to give uh, the anti-spyware companies immunity in law if they follow some kind of basic process that has some kind of arbiter, et cetera, um, and uh, it, from from making mistakes. Um, and I think that you would see anti-spyware companies be much more aggressive at, at uh, stopping new threats um, and be willing to put things up much faster if they had that kind of immunity. Uh, and it's something that we may need to explore if this problem gets much worse. Yes? Well, I think, I mean, I do think that the question, the question is sort of where are we going to see spyware next? I mean, uh, how, how do we see it, uh, and what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Sure, I think that, that is a concern, and, and that's also a, a valid point that currently um, we might not be, might not be seeing spyware um, on other, on mobile devices, for example, because there's so, so much easy picking, so many desktops, it's so easy to get, a, get onto the desktops. Um, but sure, I, I um, fully believe that we will start to see um, spyware for, for um, mobile platforms, for example. Um, and the industry will have to respond. We'll expect to see um, spyware removal tools for um, mobile platforms. Anywhere, Edgar? Well, I'd certainly agree that the VoIP phones are, are a potential threat just as much as any other piece that is hooked to the network, and the fact that there's no uh, maybe sensitive information residing within that phone doesn't mean that it cannot be a, a platform to attack the rest of the network uh, if if it's vulnerable. So in that point, from that point of view, it's it's something that uh, you need to uh, to be concerned with. From my perspective, one of the uh, ways to go around is is really to to tell uh, the the gateway or the network point of view, and not necessarily of each of the endpoints, whether the endpoint is a uh, uh, Windows, uh, Windows machine, uh, VoIP phone, or or, uh, or even a router uh, that runs some operating system and software and has its own vulnerabilities and and uh, and so on. And and some of the uh, corporate guys here and uh, in the uh, previous panel also expressed the concern that you cannot really uh, deal with uh, 50,000 uh, end users uh, in your network. So you cannot install. And many any more clients, you cannot really uh, handle that uh, very efficiently. So you need additional layers that will take a, a, a global look at the network and not just uh, try to deal with the every endpoint. Jerry, can you address the critical infrastructure question too? Yeah, you know, I think you know it comes back down to the question of motive. You know, a lot of times when you get the uh, you know electronic crimes with the money aspects, you know, for profit. 
when you start getting into, you know, back to the low hanging fruit right now. Um, you know, when I think back of, uh, you know, red teaming or pen testing, that kind of work, you know, there really hasn't been a network I haven't been able to get into. So, I mean, when you've got so much, why make it harder on yourself when you've got all that low hanging fruit? As security, you know, an organization's raised the bar from security, it's going, you know, uh, you know, things will probably start moving down that, uh, that path. Um, we've just not seen a lot of widespread activity with those type of sophisticated issues. But back to my example with the USB drives and, and CDs and, and things of that nature, I mean, there's a lot of uh, fun things you can do there. You know, again, back to some as simple as the auto run or visiting a website. Um, what's really concerning to us is that some of these websites are, you know, specifically targeted with, you know, spyware and, and, and uh, the vehicle to deliver uh, other payloads, but basically because they kind of know the typical audience that would go visit that website. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, the, the main trend that we're seeing today. Um, some of our issues is going back in and, you know, trying to get these organizations, help them clean it up. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're not, we're not your paid security consultant. You know, we always recommend that they go out and get somebody to help them with that. We'll provide some basic guidance. But, you know, we continually see some of these organizations get popped again and again and again. Um, so it's a never-ending thing, and what's always interesting is we get, you know, they'll come back and want a good housekeeping seal from U.S. CERT saying our network is safe. Can you send out a message or an advisory saying, you know, our website's safe, you know, and we're, you know, it's out of our control. But again, back to low-hanging fruit, control systems, um, you know, there's a, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, the spyware and some of the application things that are used there, you know, like ICCP, some of the protocols and stuff, I mean, that's really not a, not really seen spyware kind of take off into that environment yet. We've seen other fun and creative things take place from, you know, denial of service type issues, buffer overflows and those types of things, but nothing really uh, as it relates to spyware yet. Yes. It's a perfect question for Drew, I think, isn't it? <laughs> well, Raymond is setting me up because he works with our internet group. <laughs> so, no, no, I, I mean it, it is. It's absolutely something that we have to look at, right? As I said earlier, we were so interested in protecting the perimeter from inbound traffic that we do owe it to our customers to protect them and and developing that and what that looks like. You know, you know, you know, our internet infrastructure is. It's, you can't just slap an IPS out in front of that. Um, you're going to have to have code on there that looks at it. The, um, some sort of uh, way of identifying um, what is appropriate to be handing to the users and not maybe trusting some of the vendors as blatantly as we have. And, um, my organization, CDT, has done some reports on uh, advertiser, mainstream advertisers advertising with um, some of the, uh, of the worst ad, um, adware players, Zango and Direct Revenue, um, and uh, try to out some of the Na people whose names show up there, and I think that there's a tie between av both advertising and distribution. I mean, Warner Brothers also uh, this week uh, had a, had a deal with Zango that they've now uh, backed away from. Um, that was uh, distributing uh, uh, Zango basically on a kid site, on a cartoon site, um, uh, and ba and it said, you know, you may get firearms and uh, pornography may be displayed <laughs> through these ads, and the box was pre-checked. Uh, and it was aimed at, you know, it was clearly aimed at uh, people looking for a Fred Flintstone game and, and cartoon games. So um, we have seen uh, distribution channels, um, you know, high quality distribution channels uh, become infiltrated uh, in ways that are somewhat surprising. Yes? So uh, the one area that we look at is uh, the trustees certification. Um, it started around the online privacy, but they also started, the, I think they're beta testing the trustee download. I don't know if there's anyone from that organization here. Um, but they seem to be trying to do the same, that, that exact same thing, right? So certifying whether 
your partners down the chain? Because it does get, you know, as some of Ari's previous uh, presentations, that, that, that infrastructure, especially with adware, gets very confusing. And so it's not always easy to know that if I sign up here that it's not going to end up at, at some funding some adware down 10, 12 steps down the line. That, that's, that's the only initiative that I know of. It's the uh, it's a trustee, of, yeah. uh, trusted download program for people that are uh, in that space of the content program to look into. There are some other blacklist um, kind of ideas out there. Uh, Stop Badware, uh, which is a program that's run out of Harvard, um, and a lot of large companies like Google and others <laughs> have uh, been funding, um, has been uh, um, uh, looking into that uh, kind of the blacklist area more than the whitelist area. But the only uh, true whitelist has been trustee, and uh, it's an, actually an alpha right now. Is it alpha? I think yeah. they're moving to beta in September or October, something like that. But uh, um. there are some email initiatives for trusted mail to uh, to fight spam, but I don't think these are really scalable. So I'm, I'm not sure the concept in general is scalable. Yes. Yeah. So um, in uh, Vista, you have the concept of least user access. So um, one of the real problems, um, one of the real reasons why spyware is so widespread is because um, so many users run, run on their systems with um, elevated privilege. So um, as soon as you have a flaw in the browser, um, the spyware can take advantage of that and um, essentially um, install whatever it wants with, with no hassle. Um, so the concept in Vista is that um, you run by default as a low privilege user. Um, so sure there'll still be bugs, browser bugs for example, um, but that will actually prevent um, the installation of any software. Um, so that's one thing I can think of off the top of my head. Um, essentially any kind of sandboxing technology, um, that, that would certainly help. I was just about to say that, well, yeah. Um, did, I, I, I'm not in a great position to list all them because I'll leave someone out and then I'll upset someone on a coalition. But Sana Security is an example of one of them. And if anyone have any others that they want to name, throw out there. But uh, I mean, also part of the problem with that is, is especially with spyware, is with with the behavioral base uh, hips, it, the spyware isn't necessarily a a vulnerability at, at certain points, right? If the user actually installs it, 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 it HIPS isn't going to solve that problem. Right, but right, but even with Sana, you have to break outside of the trusted path that the, the right thing. So they baseline your system, and then all of a sudden you have to. Oh. Okay. That's right. That's the, that's my uh, okay. understanding too. All right.
So I, I do think we're starting to see more of those solutions out there, wh whether they've actually grown up enough to, to start penetrating the marketplace in ways that uh, they need to to make a huge difference. Um, I don't think we've seen that yet, but um, it's, it's, I think it's a growing trend. Yes? Exactly. <laughs> right. But but really only slightly. I mean, let's be honest. Our users are going to hit yes. Um, the, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, in, in in a creative environment like the Walt Disney Company, it's it's very difficult to lock down people that way. We we had a group that. Uh, decided that the 15 minute lockout timeout wasn't appropriate and they developed a mouse that would vibrate about 14 and a half minutes to get around it. So it, it, it'd be nice to lock them down, but you know, sometimes we have to work around that too. And what do you do with those, uh, with those groups that uh, you know, keep coming back to you asking you for certain things to be installed constantly, et cetera? Um, how, do you, how do you handle it internally? I'm sure a lot of people deal with this. Yeah, it's, it's you you have to allow it in some cases and you just try to provide enough protection either on the network itself or um, on the system that to help stop it but especially with laptop users in, in a remote global environment it's it's very difficult not to right now give them administrative privileges because at some point it's going they're going to be out there and they're going to need to install something and what about training I mean in terms of uh, in directly oh, yeah, in terms security of spyware. awareness um, we, we make everyone go through that um, and spyware is a uh, how do you go about doing it's this malicious spyware. code yeah um, I don't know that we necessarily call out spyware in the training but it's a good point <laughs> Do you want to add anything to that? I mean, I think he, it was a point yeah, yeah. as much as a question, <laughs> a good one. But well, you know, right now, from a research perspective, we work very closely with science and technology. Um, we've got a, we push in, you know, things that we're seeing as issues. You know, right now, I mean, there, you know, there's issues, you know, related to DNS amplification attacks, that kind of stuff. You know, what is a long-term solution? You know, of course, you know, we do look at the short term because we we got a lot of people that are bleeding, you know, from those types of attacks, we got to address that. But we are working to, you know, feed in requirements, and then they get prioritized. Um, as far as working with industry, I mean, we do this with a lot of the internet service providers and major telcos on tackling issues, uh, you know, back to botnets and some of those types of things. And you know, I do know that there's. I think FTC mentioned that they've got a couple of efforts where they are bringing, uh, you know, other federal agencies together as well as the private sector to kind of work through some of these issues. So I think there, there is a willingness to do um, research and, and, and put out, you know, kind of an RFI, you know, to, to the academia, you know, what are some of the potential areas to help tackle some of these long term? There's a, there's a the, uh, it, Eileen mentioned this uh, um, briefly, but there's a, a workshop in November that they're holding. Uh, it's on consumer protection generally, so it's more on the, in the consumer space. But um, the, it, it will, um, where they're going to bring together 
Um, they're, they're trying to bring exactly these groups that you mentioned together and, and, and then what Jerry was talking about. Uh, and uh, th they're also planning on having all of the international law enforcement, they're all other law, international law enforcement partners together for a day for a closed session just for them to try and figure out how to work together internationally since so much of this touches on international servers, et cetera. Um, and that's kind of looking at that issue in the future. Uh, but I do think that if you have ideas about uh, you know, getting ahead of the game, um, that is a good place to raise it. Um, and it would, it, you know, the, the DHS people and the DOJ people are going to be at those sessions as well as, uh, but, uh, you know, it's a good idea, it's also a good idea to have DHS sponsor something like that as well on those kind of issues. And, and actually, you know, Mark is over here, he's actually working with uh, science and technology, might be able to speak to some of, uh, One of the things that we've seen on our side from doing the, the forensic work to try and bring some of these cases to the FTC and state AG's attention is that, you know, it takes us a month or two to investigate it. Then it takes them 10 months to bring a case. I mean, in the Sanford Walls case, which was a case that we thought we really laid out for them on a silver platter, um, it took them 10 months to, to actually to, to bring the case to fruition where they actually uh, shut the guy down. Um, and then, uh, you know, he didn't end up... Uh, being punished for, for uh, over a year past that. Um, and in more complicated cases, as uh, Eileen was saying earlier, the where you're talking about seven or eight partners involved, it's even more, it's even harder than that. Um, and I guess the question of really um, helping in terms of forensics, how do we get, um, you know, I think CERT has made a lot of, has, has done a lot of positive work uh, in, on the virus side, do, doing for active forensic work and group forensic work for, in that area, how do we get that same kind of forensic work for spyware and uh, malware? Um, you know, uh, Jerry, Ron, I don't know if anybody. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Jerry's volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there, there's obviously no shortage of uh, work in this space. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, there, there's some existing models that can be leveraged to, to help out. I know, uh, you know, just even on, even on the phishing stuff, you know, we put out a section on the USCERT.gov website, report phishing here, and, you know, my team about killed me the next day because we just got hammered. Um, you know, the volume is very high. That's why we went and partnered with these uh, organizations, these not-for-profits, to actually take that information, triage it, you know, is it the same, you know, same person that's originating the, the fish or, or what have you, and then getting it into, you know, to the folks either prioritize it for law enforcement as well as getting it into commercial products. And I think the same similar type activity is going to kind of have to, uh, you know, I think the anti-spy effort is going to have to move in that direction as well to be effective. So this chain of questions started with the R&D. So while I did say in the beginning that uh, I don't think technology is, is the main, uh, is the only, certainly not the only way to solve the problem. Uh, we are, of course, involved in uh, several uh, efforts. One of them goes to, back to the uh, behavioral issues. So uh, we focus on the uh, phone home part of the spyware issue. Uh, we want to, we're trying to block things going in, but of course, if they are already in, the main issue now is to uh, block any information trying to go uh, to get out of the organization. So, uh, and there are suspicious communications that you, uh, even if you do not have the signatures or the rules, you, you know that what you see is suspicious, you know that what you see is something that you wanna, you wanna block, even if you don't understand why. So of course there's always this issue of false positives with uh, behavioral issues and, and, and so on, but that's one line of uh, research for us. The other one uh, relates also to the collaboration that I, I talked about before between, uh, between uh, security vendors and Hopefully, uh, with, with the uh, other uh, other players like the ISP. So there's 
uh, desktop vendor represented here in the audience, and I uh, firmly believe that when we uh, integrate our capabilities and we are able to update one another what we see in the gateway, what some other folks are seeing on the desktop, we are bet in a better position to, to detect, to block, and to remove uh, Spire from the, uh, from the infrastructure, with, from, uh, <coughs> excuse me, from the endpoints. Thanks, Anne. You have any comments, John? Um, I think from a R and D perspective, there's not a single um, technological advance that will put an end to spyware. Um, it's going to be a combination of things. Like ideally, um, if we can stop the spyware getting on the, on there, stop it getting to the point of attempting to install, that would be perfect. But we're, we're not going to get that because if, there's always going to be bugs in software. Um, there's always going to be users as well that, that click various things. Um, if we so we can definitely improve in that area, um, and then the next step is during installation, can we block it then? And then the next step is um, assume it's somehow installed. Um, can we actually stop it running? Can we detect it? So I think there's um, improvements to be made in all of those areas. Let me ask this question this way, which is: uh, Are we going to? I mean, are we ever going to see an end, complete end to spyware, or is it just going to keep changing? And becoming different on us, um, and and that's the best we can hope for is to minimize it. Um, go down the line. Actually. Sure. Um, right now, I don't think we're going to see it. I can't um, envisage an end to it, um, simply because um, even if we were able to um, remove all bugs from browser software, that kind of thing, um, it's as we've talked about, um, especially in the first session, it's a, a user problem as much as anything. So I think that will, um, regardless of the levels of education you give your users, um, they'll still do dumb things. As I said before, there are many aspects where I see similarities between Spire and Terror, and uh, one of them is uh, the end of it. I mean, there's no nothing like that in sight, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, even if we can develop a system that has no vulnerabilities, we, we I mean, we've talked a lot about users and, and their ability and wanting to click on anything that pops up on the screen, but we also have to remember that there are malicious users um, that could be in the in your network. Um, so if the criminal doesn't can't get in through the network, it's easy to go down and, and not easy, but hire someone, get them into your company, and have them in, and try to install it. So that's also uh, an avenue that we haven't discussed yet. I think the reality is, is you know, pretty much we're going to be managing the risk. We're going to be managing spyware, or you know, pick a problem. You know, it, you know, it's going to be a continual cat and mouse game. The best that we can do is manage and try to mitigate, and you know, look, you know, still reach for the long-term solutions. But again, you know, folks are going to you know take advantage of that as well. So, you know, there's there's other threats that are right around the horizon. So, yes. No, no. This is this was this is broader than it includes keystroke loggers and it does not include cookies. The study you can you can look up. It's a National Cybersecurity Alliance uh, study that they've been doing. Right. Well, this gets at this gets at Ron's this gets at Ron's question from earlier. I mean, is is the problem of the future going to be quantity or is it going to be the quality of this spyware? Um, uh, I think you know that 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 Ron made a good point there in his uh, opening. There, uh, does anyone do other people have viewpoints on that? Well, no. I, I mean, I think it's definitely going to be quality, right? Because it, it's an evolution right now. So you have botnets out there and people going out and doing it. As it becomes more difficult to do it, only the more experienced or people with more uh, impetus to want to do it are going to do it, and those are going to be your criminal element trying to make money. Well, yeah, but yeah, adware companies making forty-two, fifty-two million dollars a year. Um, I mean, the the less legitimate ones making forty-two.
up with a new True. business model that uh, venture capitalists are willing to support. And kind of skirt the, the lines of law. Right. Yeah. But no, I, I, I still think it's going to be more of the quality of it. Anyone else want to venture, I guess? Um, as we talked about earlier, um, we may see that um, currently the desktop may be seen as low-hanging fruit, so as that becomes more locked down, then as we discussed, um, there may be a um, proliferation of spyware on other platforms, so VoIP mo uh, mobile platforms. So it may just shift. I'm just going to point out, you know, just like we saw the problem of you know, speeding tickets, people don't speed anymore, right? So, I mean, you know, it, we're, we're going to always have these challenges. It's why it comes back to managing risk within your environment. So. Well, it comes back down to, you know, what was just talked about with the sophistication. And again, you know, my earlier comment about some of the targeted activity, that's been a wake-up call for a lot of companies. I mean, some of these are Fortune 50, some are, you know, in the Fortune 500 realm. Um, that was a wake-up call. You know, their proprietary information was, you know, being targeted. So, you know, that's, you know, it's not your general, you know, your typical consumer-based type, you know, spyware. It's when you start getting into the more sophisticated stuff and the more targeted type activity. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, as you know, history has shown, you know, organizations react when some major event happens and sometimes, you know, it's us knocking at the door saying, um, you've got a problem. So, you know, again, you know, it, it's a wake up call for a lot of organizations. So, you know, and again, they'll do, they'll ramp up, throw a lot of money, you know, do the security awareness, you know, and then, you know, things will, a period of time might settle back down and they'll fall back into some complacency but again you know until the next big event so I mean it seems like we keep getting stuck in that cycle and uh, you know th there is you know there's a non-technical you know that you can keep doing awareness but at some point you know folks do start to tune out so I don't know you know if you got a solution for that I'm all ears one last question Well, I, I cannot provide you with the education material, but uh, what we recently provided a company, uh, Drew talked before about transparency. I mean, one of the issues is really knowing, on, not knowing what's going on in, in your network and having the users being aware of what's going on in their machines. Sometimes they're not really aware. So one way would be to bring into the network some way to mirror everything that's going on spy-wise in the network in a recent financial company that we've been uh, in we uh, demonstrated to the IT guys a keylogger that was installed in one of the uh, uh, more, uh, say, well-guarded parts of the organization. Now, it ended up being something that was installed by one of their employees who wanted to work from home, but uh, bypassing all of the company uh, uh, guidelines and, and so on. But this is, I guess, one of the issues that Drew had in mind when he asked, okay, I, I don't know what's going on in my network. I don't know what sort of tools people are installing, people that I trust, but not necessarily uh, are following the rules. So uh, in general, I think that one of the best ways to make uh, people aware is really just uh, showing them the, the data. And, and, and there are tools, auditing tools, uh, that can basically give a complete uh, picture of uh, Spyro on the network, which machines are infected by what, and giving some feedback directly to the uh, end users uh, about what's installed on their machines and even providing them with some guidance about what to do about it without having the IT guys uh, dealing with uh, uh, 50 or 70,000 machines. You know, as, as far as the certifying of a, a vendor, I, I think that was something you were asking about. It, really, we got to rely upon work that the CDT uh, does 
and trying to root out these because it gets very complicated. And I don't know that uh, the corporate do we have enough resources to actually go through all the you know show me the entire chain and how you know our ads could possibly end up somewhere that they shouldn't be um, you know a lot of that probably would end up just in the contract and trying to reduce the risk um, to the vendor if you do this you'll get this penalty um, but yeah, then also we talked about the trustee stuff earlier. The certifications of the of these vendors, I think, is going to. I, I think we'll see more of that going on. That's only a good place to stop. Anyone, unless anyone else have a final comment. Well, thank you very much. Good session. Thank you. Thanks, guys.